The revolution brought radical changes also to the social life of the people. A rural development campaign based largely on student teacher volunteers and backed by the slogan, if you know, teach, if you don't know, learn, was one of its major achievements. Never before had city and country dwellers made contact in such a way. This unprecedented drive against illiteracy bridged the social gap of centuries, bringing mutual understanding and a sense of common purpose to the far-flung peoples of the nation. The rural development campaign had a second purpose besides, the teaching of health and basic hygiene. Nothing remotely like it had ever been tried before. For the first time in their history, the Somali peoples were brought together as a whole, not as rival clans or factions, but as a nation, eager from these small beginnings with the reading and writing of their mother tongue to grow and prosper for the common good. Doctors and teachers together, no matter how remote the community they visited, nor how poor communications, scoured the Somali countryside to carry out their missions of enlightenment. <laughs> For the campaign, the entire nation was mobilized. Its every resource, both human and material, were drawn upon. At the end of the first six-month phase, its supporters and the nation's leaders turned out to greet the returning students who had played so large a part in its obvious success. <laughs> It was time to acknowledge that this was also the first time the nation had benefited from the collective energy of its young people, of its students, who would be among its leaders tomorrow. And in thanksgiving for this fact, great festivals of youth were held throughout the country. In Mogadishu, President Siad himself attended these festivals, presenting medals and scrolls to all who had distinguished themselves over the grueling half year. With the campaign, the Somali people had reached a peak of national unity. Its benefits seen, progressive forces throughout the country stood ready to defend the gains of the revolution. Students now, with teachers, youth groups, doctors, farmers, engineers and the armed forces themselves, were all united in their resolve to carry the nation further still. Publicly accepted as active participants in their country's struggle, 
the nation's youth celebrated with colorful displays of their achievements and their future hopes. As we've already seen, former generations of Somali students had to learn of the world through foreign languages and cultures. Today, they are taught up to the secondary level, at least in Somali. With government prompting, the Somali alphabet was agreed in 1973, enabling the first Somali books to be published for use in primary, intermediate, and secondary education. At last, the young could learn of and take pride in the culture and history of their own country. The revolution had pledged equality for women also. No longer suppressed by convention, girls and women today are given equal rights in education and the national life. They rank, in fact, among the leaders of the new society. For these future mothers of the nation, domestic science and needlework are new additions to the syllabus. <laughs> And the educated woman is important for another equally fundamental reason. As the center of family life, without encouragement from her, tomorrow's children will grow and learn more slowly. <laughs> Any country without a national university will have problems in carrying out development projects on its own. It just won't have the skilled technicians. Accepting this as self-evident, an early task of the revolution was to endow a first-class university with faculties chosen to meet the country's specific needs. And their doing so bore fruit. Many of Somalia University's graduates today have already played leading parts in countless development projects of national importance. Elections in 64 and 69 had caught the people confused and politically innocent. Now, special orientation centers were built where they could learn their basic responsibility towards society at large. The centers stressed the value of national unity. Above all, they worked to eradicate ancient clan divisions and feuds. The centers are working. People of all kinds gather here to discuss their problems, seeking and offering solutions on the basis of each other's experience but they are not just political forums. Despite their title, they are used also as local sports grounds for the young, places where healthy minds can grow in healthy bodies. And whoever they be, every person who comes to a center will find a platform on which to express his or her views. Universally adopted, they have become the community centers of the nation. And then in 1973, the land itself came under attack. Huge moving sand dunes had rolled in from the coast to threaten the fertile southern farmlands of Chalambod. From its earliest days, the revolution had tried to contain them, but despite willing volunteers, its resources were limited. Something had to be done, something definitive, something on a national scale, and plans were drawn up for the battle ahead. Within a matter of weeks, the power and determination of the nation could be seen. Workers and farmers from towns and villages throughout the land poured into help. At their peak, they numbered 11,000. Their scheme was unique, so simple and cheap that it bordered on genius. Drought-resistant scrub and cacti were brought in. Beneath a thin scattering of topsoil, these were planted in rows to bind the dunes and hold them. <laughs> 
foreign experts advising the government at the outset had costed the problem solution in millions, millions Somalia never could afford. Today, these same experts come here to Shalambod to marvel and study in their own turn. The dunes have been halted in a mere few months, proving the old proverb, wherever there's a will, there's always a way. The sands were beaten, but nature was cruel, attacking immediately from another flank. Now it was the nomads' turn to suffer. A blistering drought hit the country's northwest. Trees were blasted, the earth parched. Livestock died and the people with them. Appeals for help poured in from the afflicted zones. Government supplies were rushed to the stricken region, followed by massive international aid. Throughout the disaster zone, relief camps were set up and clothing, food, medicine and vital water provided. An early visitor to the zone was President Siad himself, come to judge with his own eyes the extent of the damage and the effect of the relief work. As he walked among the victims, his distress was plain to see. In his mind, an old dream became a firm decision. These people have lost everything they had and our task is clear. We must assure them of a stable environment in the future. And we can only do so by uprooting and resettling them on the southern farmlands. Only by resettlement here or along the coast and retraining as farmers and fishermen can we guarantee them any future. Somalia's two great southern rivers, the Juba and Shabele, enclose a vast and fertile flood plain as yet only part developed for agriculture. And it was here that the nomads would be resettled. The operation was far from easy. 120,000 people had volunteered to make the move and traveled from the relief camps to a central dispersal point in the north. From here, they would be transported to their new homes in the south and east in one great move by road and air. For the future farmers were settlements at Kurtemwari, Sablale and Dujuma. For the fishermen at Brawe, Ail and Adale. And so, on June the 18th, 1975, the great trek began. Families who had somehow saved their homes from drought and earlier moves dismantled them. Precious possessions were packed and stowed away for a journey that would take them from everything they had ever known and into a future far removed at which they could only guess. Infants and invalids were carried onto waiting lorries. Papers were checked as whole families moved together. The entire nation's transport resources had been mobilized and others borrowed from abroad. 16 landing strips had been built for 24 huge transport planes, while over 600 lorries took on the rest. In lorry after lorry, covering hundreds of miles, the new farmers moved south. Within days, the first arrivals reached Kortimwari, and local people turned out by the score to greet and welcome them to a new life far removed from the old. Even the mud and rain which greeted them also must have seemed a godsend after the horrors of drought. Come on, 
Neat rows of tents stood ready and waiting as temporary accommodation for those whose houses had been destroyed back in the north. While those who had saved theirs set to quickly rebuilding them in the new settlement. <laughs> Meanwhile, the future fishermen were also on the move, southwards and east to their new homes along the coast. Day after day, the huge convoys rolled, carrying their precious cargo to safety and a new life. The first arrivals in Adale. Wherever the refugees went, they met with the same warm reception. Here too, as in Kurtimwari, houses had had to be built to accommodate the new settlers. And no sooner had they settled in than school started for the children. For those of the farmers in the open air, while here in the fishing town of Brawe, their brothers found a schoolroom already built and waiting. Nor were the children the only ones to take lessons. Most of these men had never even seen the sea, yet their new life demanded not only that they see it, but learn to enter, swim and survive in it as well. <laughs> Retraining began for the farmers also. At both Kurtimwari and Dujuma, the nomads were allocated 18,000 hectares of undeveloped land, which, under expert guidance, they would be expected to make productive within two years. For the fishermen, a first necessity was to learn of the different species of fish off Somalia's coast, of their shape, size and value. While the farmers learned of the best crop strains to plant in a given soil. And then there were their tools, the nets, boats and outboard motors of the fishermen. Without knowledge and care of these, however would they survive? Fishing is one thing, showing instant returns. Farming is different, needing more time and repaying its errors far more harshly. Here, patience and great thoroughness in preparing their land were the lessons the new farmers had to learn. And yet, a mere three weeks after their arrival on the coast, the day dawned for the fishermen's first real trial at sea. As the first nets were cast, so inland, the farmers sowed the seeds of their first harvest. It was a day of hard work, but jubilation. Certainly for the fishermen, their first outing was successful. But then Somalia's sea is rich. The fishermen could actually see and weigh the value of their work. For the farmers, success was not so instant. They had to have faith. But still, their hopes were high that what they had ploughed and sown would soon enough flourish also to repay them for their trust. Somalia is a member country of various international groupings, among them the Organization of African Unity, the Arab League, and the Organization of Non-Aligned Countries. Today, it speaks as a voice in the world at large, a voice to whose views on international relations and foreign policy the world pays ever-increasing attention and respect. In 1974, African heads of state assembled in Mogadishu, the Somali capital, to see President Siad take his turn as chairman of the Organization of African Unity. <laughs> in 
In his opening speech to the summit meeting, the president talked at length about Somalia's domestic and foreign policy since the revolution. In referring to her progressive stand on matters of mutual concern such as the post-colonial heritage, he assured his listeners of Somalia's support, both moral and material, for progressive and liberation movements and governments throughout the African continent. In particular, he singled out the southern countries of the continent, Zimbabwe and South Africa, whose peoples still suffered the iniquities of direct colonial rule. June the 8th, 1976. This was the day on which the Supreme Revolutionary Council endorsed the creation of a new civilian socialist party to which it could confidently entrust the future government of the Somali nation. It was to be a socialist party of national consent. Such an experience was totally new to Somalia, and yet after so many years of struggle, development and achievement, the SRC was satisfied its job was done and the time had come to relinquish military rule. In their resolution to this effect, they thereby fulfilled their final pledges of the first and second charters of the revolution. For seven long years, the SRC had worked to make Somalia's people proud of their own history, alive to past mistakes, and politically conscious of their future responsibility. Now the people gathered to put all this to the test. It was the first time that delegates from all sectors of the country's life had ever met to have a say in the nation's future. Over 3,000 of them, workers, young people, women, all proving in their speeches just how ready for their new role they were and how willing. Now President Siad asked for nominations to the Politburo and offices of the new party. By a unanimous show of hands, he was himself elected Secretary General. And so the other officers were likewise voted into being. One by one in their nomination speeches, the various national and local delegates expressed their support for the SRC resolution. The party's foundation was voted on and approved, together with all its principal officers. In all, five members of the SRC were voted onto the new Politburo. <laughs> Vice President Ismail congratulated the delegates on their democratic conduct of the election and their willing assumption of responsibility. For his part, as leader of the October Revolution, President Siad was awarded a specially cast medal from the Somali people. Then came the turn of the armed forces. They had been the spine and sinews of the October Revolution, and now, unit by unit, they entered the election hall. One by one, their officers pledged their loyalty for the newly elected Socialist Party, and assured the new civilian government of their unqualified support as the nation moved onward toward the achievement of its next goal, the creation of a unified, democratic nation, fit and ready to take its full part among the progressive peoples of the world. <laughs> Next to come in were the children, many of them born since the October Revolution. Representing the future of the country, they came in to join their elders in celebrating the new age of which their good fortune had made them a part. In his closing speech for the day, President Siad spoke proudly of the delegates' evident spirit, sincerity, and of their obvious will for national unity. And he had also a special word for the children present, promising them that the new party would see them through to still better times in days to come. Hero of Somalia medals were then presented by President Siad to every member of the outgoing SRC, who had fought with and steered the revolution since its beginning in 1969. One by one, the members of the former government received their medals from the president. Finally, in his turn, the president received the same medal for his part also in the revolution. Oh, my God.
The third day of the meeting was spent by the delegates in discussions on the new party's constitution. In his closing speech, President Seard added his voice to those of many others when he stressed those clauses in it that made it a living part of the continuing drive towards full national unity and progress. Following this, he appealed to all Somalis, whatever their place in life, to pledge total support for the fledgling Socialist Party. And already crowds were gathering in the streets outside the conference centre to applaud and cheer the new party's creation. The day after the meeting closed, the new party's central committee sat for the first time to take stock of the enormous responsibilities that now lay on their shoulders. <laughs> In the streets and public places of Mogadishu and other cities, people were turning out by the thousand to demonstrate their support. To one such rally in Mogadishu, President Seard came out to speak. He said how glad he was to sense their genuine enthusiasm for the party. Today, he said, we are entering a new era in which every individual will find complete freedom in fulfilling his responsibilities to those around him and to the nation as a whole. <laughs> No sooner had the party been legally established than political orientation courses were started for party members. Given their heavy new responsibilities, the courses were designed to extend, deepen and develop to the full their political education and awareness that had first been coaxed into life back in the orientation centers of the revolution. <laughs> At a major press conference, the Minister of Information briefed all foreign correspondents in the country on the background, formation and purpose of the party. We felt it was time, he said. Our nation is ready now and able to support such a movement. At the same conference, he answered questions on the new constitution, pointing out details of its social and economic clauses. To a question on its origins, he reminded his audience that the answer lay in the mandate of the Somali people. Party membership cards, now printed, are today being issued in growing numbers to the public, eager at last to play a personal role in the life and decisions of their nation. And so the Somali people have crossed the threshold of a new future. For them, as for others, sunrise is a symbol of hope. And from this time forward, they will know and be sure that every single day will bring a new dawn of achievement. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 